Excellent. Well, first, I also wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners and the country that we're in today and also that we live and work. So I live and work on Gadigal land, otherwise known as Sydney. And I think uh, traditional owners also have a tremendous role to play in biosecurity going forward. I also wanted to give a shout out to my co-author, Andrew Turley, who works with me at the ALA in biosecurity, as well as a number of my colleagues that have contributed information on this talk today. So I hope to convince you of two things. Uh, one, uh, the importance of large data aggregation for showing the impact of citizen science. And two, uh, to start focusing our attention more on environmental biosecurity and the role that citizen science can play and absolutely demonstrate impact. So for those of you, just very quickly, because I think some of those are, aren't too familiar about what the Atlas of Living Australia is all about, we have um, now 135 million occurrence records, which represent the bulk of our data. We also have absence data. We also have systematic survey data. But as I said, the bulk are these opportunistic uh, records. And so we aggregate from about 850 data sources, um, iNaturalist being sort of the most primary at the moment, the most popular in Australia, but of course pulling in information from other apps such as FeralScan government databases, Nature Mapper, et cetera. And so with this aggregated science information, it presents a really rich picture of species distribution throughout Australia. And then we, we also send that information to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, who aggregates uh, biodiversity data from nodes all over the world. And you can really see this massively rich picture of biodiversity around the, around the world as a result. And so this figure is from a paper that was published a few months ago where we partition citizen science data and non-citizen science data in the atlas. And so by non-citizen science, it's everything else. So it's government data, it's museums and collections, research, industry, etc. And so the ALA started in 2010. And what you can see is that very quickly, citizen science has shot off um, to be what I think the most important source of biodiversity data in Australia. And again, these figures are from this paper that we recently published. Um, I actually think this donut is uh, now tips quite in favor of citizen science. So we did this analysis a couple of years ago, um, but back in 2021, it was pretty much an even split of citizen science data versus other sources in the atlas. And the reason why I think this picture has changed just in a few years is my uh, colleague, Cam Fletcher, did some analysis of the data that we pulled in just last year, and 96% of it was citizen science, uh, which is massive, a 10 million record. And um, still, the bulk of that is bird information. So uh, a quick shout out about the importance of diversity in our observations. I am a birder, though. I do love birds. Um, and also the value of iNaturalist in particular because it is actually our most important data source for other taxa. But something that is underrepresented in the atlas are, is invasive species information. So again, these numbers are uh, a little bit old, uh, but we estimate that we have about 2,300 species, invasive species, record, species in the atlas. And this is probably about 2 million occurrence records now. And while this sounds impressive, we know that this is a massive underrepresentation of what currently exists. So this is some work looking at different um, biosecurity data sets in Australia. So we have the Atlas. We have some other databases that we pull information on, such as iNaturalist. But there's also um, the primary biosecurity databases in Australia represented here. And we think of biosecurity now as being how biodiversity data was before the Atlas. So really fragmented, really um, siloed data sets. And so we think of the Atlas that we have a huge role to play in trying to help advise and guide the biosecurity sector into how to have more kind of collaborative data sharing. Um, but also we think the ALA can have tremendous value, particularly in the environmental biosecurity area. 
So with this in mind, uh, we partnered with the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry a couple of years ago in an area of the Chief Environmental Biosecurity Office and extended this partnership to the Plant Protection Office in the same department a year later. And it was great to see that DAF is a, sp is a sponsor of the AXA conference. That's in recognition, I think, of their growing um, role they see of citizen science and its importance. So our pilot was simple in premise, a uh, biosecurity alert system, where we would take the two lists from this government department, and when a species of interest came into the atlas, we would ping them with an email biosecurity alert. So we were lucky to get some additional funding from a national initiative early this year called Catalyzing Australia's Biosecurity. And so we've been able to expand the biosecurity alert system to other states and territories, a few local governments as well. And within that, there are multiple users within the state and territory governments. So we've got representatives from aquatic pests, uh, invertebrates, plant diseases, etc. Our standout, um, the only states and territories that we don't have a list from is South Australia and Northern, Inter Northern Territory. We have been trying, we've been pestering a little bit. So if there are people here that have a good contact, please let Andrew, who's up here, or myself know. Um, and part of this funding has been to also improve our governance and our thinking around data management and biosecurity, and also how the Atlas can increase the amount of data um, specific to biosecurity, because we know that the more data, the better our alerts will be. We've also developed new spatial functionality with this funding where we can uh, filter by state and territory, obviously uh, local government area and national park. And our most recent build was um, to be able to send an alert outside of a known species distribution with cane toads being the obvious example where departments don't want an alert every time a record is reported, but they do want to know when it's outside of their kind of known um, distribution. And another species that this could equally apply to would be the red important fire ant, where we have a good idea where they are around Brisbane, um, but there's a lot of concern around their spread southward. And so this is how it works. So we have, um, we run it out of our, our programming language, Gala. Um, there's a manual process at first where a jurisdiction sends us a list of species that they're interested in. Uh, my colleague Andrew uh, processes the lists, uh, checks for synonyms and spelling um, errors, etc. And then there's a three-step uh, process within R, one which deduplicates records, uh, one that tags each list to each user, then it goes into querying our bio cage, which is where our species occurrence records sit, um, and then it downloads the fields that we send in this alert email. And then finally, we built the tables and the thumbnail, and we just automated this alert functionality just a few weeks ago, where it sends out an email alert to a user if the species uh, comes into the ALA over a weekly period. So this is an example of a biosecurity alert. And if there are multiple uh, species um, pertaining to one user's list, they'd just be aggregated below. And so we supply the scientific name, the common name if it exists, um, obviously location information, a list information, and people can click on the link and they can go and drill down to the exact location where it was recorded and a photo um, if available. And the most relevant thing to all of this is that by far, the biosecurity alerts are being driven by our naturalist. I'd say 95% of records that we're sending to these departments are coming from INAT, some from feral scan, some from other sources, but it's absolutely the eyes and ears on the ground of citizen scientists that are driving this functionality. So this is a case study. So citizen science, our holy grail, is trying to demonstrate impact. Um, and this is from Steve in Biosecurity Queensland. So it's an alert, that email that we sent to Steve a couple weeks ago um, about this cactus. Um, and we didn't pay him to tell us this. Um, so he said that there's no doubt that the biosecurity alert system has improved our statewide surveillance capability, mainly due to the capture of iNaturalist detections from the 18,000 users in Queensland. And so what happened in this case is um, they received the email alert, 
less than a week later, they went to the site um, that we said that for. They located two plants, took samples, eradicated them, and identified. We were just talking about illegal dumping earlier, um, and then um, found evidence that, that something had been illegally dumped. So, and then he went on to highlight the importance of this species and, and the concern the department has. Um, so it's a really tangible example of, of impact. And just quickly, just a few other examples. So we sent alerts about the RIFAs um, outside of their uh, known distribution. Um, and also, uh, you know, see your topweed. This is an interesting one where an individual moved interstate and brought it along in a pot plant, um, but it's actually prohibited in New South Wales. And then this Mediterranean fruit fly, it's actually a sterile individual that was released on purpose by the department in South Australia, but nonetheless, we were able to demonstrate that people are um, picking up these really, really important observations. And so there are some challenges uh, with, with biosecurity and with us becoming more invested in this area. So I think, first of all, um, thinking about I'm not sure specifically because it does represent the bulk of our, our alerts. We do have, obviously, excellent AI uh, behind INAT, but it does have errors, if everything does. And sometimes we get rare species being treated as exotic species, and also the converse, where we have high-priority species that are conflated with, with native. Um, but the next slide, I'll talk about how we're starting to address some of these false positives. In terms of the atlas and our role in biosecurity, um, Obviously, a lot of our observation and our way that we validate data is through photos or sound. Um, we don't do well with viruses and bacteria. Um, and we're also thinking really closely about the value of secondary observations. And this is something that's being talked a lot, particularly in Europe. Um, so we know we have a lot of images of, say, wildlife disease that was mentioned earlier. But we currently don't way have a way of extracting this information from the species observation itself. So we're thinking very carefully uh, about how we might do this. We may use platforms like Digivol and how and get the public to help us extract this secondary information. Um, but it's something really important so that we can better inform um, groups such as Wildlife Health Australia. And so finally, in terms of the benefits, um, so we have good evidence that biosecurity agencies, when they receive the alert, they, they look at them carefully, obviously. Um, but they have gone back into systems like our naturalist and corrected false positives. Um, they've also gone back and contacted users and asked for more information and asked if they could collect a specimen, for example. Um, and so this ability to amend reports in doing so, improve the AI behind the validation is, is very important one great outcome from this work. I think governments are starting to realize the value of this. I think there is perhaps an initial reluctance, initial fear about open data. Um, and there are some very trade sensitive species in Australia, and I don't want to downplay that. But they're realizing that actually having oversight of something that's already in the public sphere uh, is, is very powerful and very important. Um, and we have evidence where they're using the information that they're receiving in the alerts to inform communities, to muster community support, um, to, to go in and to monitor uh, certain locations more heavily. And I think, crucially, as I mentioned before, um, the holy grail of citizen science is showing impact and influencing on decision making. And this project has clear links um, right through citizen science observations through to um, actionable management um, and, and potentially policy implications as a result. Um, so as a final oops, sorry, <laughs> call to arms, I think uh, we all have to report uh, native species, think about also um, invasive species and the really important role that we can have in observing them and reporting them. Okay, we've got time for some questions before we start the next speaker. So, if you've got a question, put your hand up. Annie, I'll bring this mic to you. 
Thanks, Aaron. That's great. Um, so in terms of the insects, identifying insects, I mean, it's often problematic when you think about, you know, red and pink fire ants are tiny little things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really critical that we try to, you know, limit their spread. And so we've got all these people out there that could possibly help with that. But then there's the issue of identification and misidentification. So, I, I, excuse my ignorance if, you know, if I say this, but isn't it just about improving the, the AI on that and getting some really great quality, you know, pictures, mm -hmm. you know, that, to help with that? Yeah, I think for some species, improved AI is really valuable. Other species, you need to know habitat and context a little bit more. I think the important message is that we don't care what app people are using. So we know, for example, that the Department of Ag and, and Fisheries is investing in another app um, that will have, um, they, they train the images on very high quality images um, and then train the AI to really um, be able to identify that with much more certainty. And so as long as the AI gets that information, that will be in the alerts. And so I think that there are some species, and I think ants is an example where you really probably perhaps need something more than just a generic photo to be able to really properly identify some of these. Um, but there are some species, of course, that just train the AI to improve the suggestion. Um, where, and that's where we get a lot of the false positives from is an excellent start. Um, can I just respond as a taxonomist? <laughs> Only about, uh, what would you say, 5% of the insects in Australia actually have published valid names. My first comment would be, don't go to ARs, <laughs> go to taxonomists and fund taxonomists to actually provide valid published names. I think my but, colleague yeah. Andrew would agree with you. He knows more than Get the universities to make it more attractive as a career too because the numbers have plummeted, haven't they? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I'll, you're, you're waving your hand much better. You're next. You're first, please. Uh, besides killing myself, I <laughs> ask the question. Um, Aaron, um, I, I do look at iNaturalist a lot, and what I don't notice is comments back from the people getting the alerts. Okay. So if yeah. I'm a person providing that information, I distrust government because most of us do. <laughs> I want to see that actually what I'm doing is making a difference. I know. So I want to get something back that says, yeah, I went out. I remove that prickly pear and thank you for doing it. Yeah. And if other people can see that I've got that feedback, they're going to say, oh, I think I might have seen that prickly pear somewhere. Yeah. And I just think that thought needs to be going into building that feedback into all this apps and things because that's what's going to drive the success, not I, the yeah, identification. I completely agree that that is the missing piece at the moment. I know that some departments are doing that. Um, and commenting on naturalists and as I said, um, mustering citizens to go to particular areas. I absolutely agree with you that that's what will continue to grow the success of this project. And I think that there is a role for the ALA here because we are kind of that bridge between the data and government in this instance to better communicate the outcomes that we're seeing as a result of this program. So it's some homework for Andrew and I in the new year. Hi, sorry. Um, it's called the Atlas of Living Australia. I'm probably the devil's advocate here, but since we're at a conference, like by the end of this conference, I probably will have possibly downloaded 20 apps. Mm. So is there not a way, given that we are limited in funding in the conservation field, that everybody can't kind of get together and reduce the number of apps? Because like, there's also only so many phones can carry. Um, and I know it's not, it's not a space specifically for you, but for yeah. kind of everybody to think about um, that we upload the data to less than five sources or yeah. several sources and that more collaboration within the space could happen, maybe. I think it's a really, really important point you're making. Um, as, as Because we have such oversight, we see a lot of 
deportation. And I think people um, don't realize when they go out to build an app the cost of the app. And not only that, when funding runs out, there's no funding to maintain it, and then it quickly becomes very obsolete. And so we always, always advocate to try, first and foremost, to use an existing app, if at all possible, not to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then, you know, as I say, the, the last solution is just to make sure that your data goes into the atlas so that it can be aggregated. Um, but fair call. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if we can thank Erin. Oh, sorry, we have to stop now, sorry, because we're looking at the time. Can we thank Erin for her presentation, please?